Well, good morning. And I'm so glad to see this room fill up with many new faces and some faces that we've seen in the past. Thank you for your attention and for your concern in this field. It's such a pleasure to be here today with all of you. And I'd like to begin by thanking Richard and Pia Simpson for their continued commitment to this conference and for the opportunity to speak on behalf of the Whittemore Peterson Institute. Today we will hear from medical experts and research scientists about the unique circumstances confronting the most severely affected ME patients. It is a subject that is especially dear to me and my family since we have a daughter who has been in and out of that category of ME for over 20 years. The Simpsons also share that extraordinary burden because they, like many of you, are deeply impacted by a neurological disease that has been misnamed, poorly defined, and completely misunderstood. As parents of two very ill children, they could have done nothing more than take care of their family, which we would have all understood. But instead, they have chosen to take action. By creating this conference several years ago, they've succeeded in helping to fill the serious informational gap that exists between the reality of a devastating disease and a misguided government-controlled medical field. Please join me in giving them and their organization a round of applause for their outstanding work. Last night, Hillary Johnson, author of the book Osler's Web, spoke eloquently of the existing injustices surrounding this disease. She makes a compelling case against the CDC, or Centers for Disease Control, for their negligent handling of a reported outbreak, doing nothing to stop the spread of this disease, misusing the few research dollars available to this field, all while attempting a mass cover-up of the serious nature of this disease. We could spend a lot of try time trying to convince them that they were right and we are wrong, but we have chosen instead to move the field ahead by creating an institute for patients built on credible research. In the end, I believe patients and doctors will be vindicated and the CDC will move on to the next crisis. I would like to thank Hillary for her continued contributions to this field and for her kind words of support for the work of the institute. Thank you, Hillary. One of the most important missions of the Whittemore Peterson Institute is to create a highly regarded research program that will meet the toughest standards of scientific rigor we believe it is imperative to have our work validated because this field is given so little scientific credibility. We also believe it is our duty to have our findings peer reviewed and published in the best possible journals because it is apparent that we are in a battle with those who would like to create a psychological illness from the devastating disease we know as ME. We believe this battle can only be won using a combination of scientific truth and patient advocacy. The purpose of today's events, however, are not to focus on our society's failures to understand and support the ill, but rather to celebrate the very real successes in this field that have come from the laboratories and offices of dedicated researchers, skilled and compassionate doctors, and the many private individuals and foundations from around the world. Richard asked me to come today to speak about the new Whittemore Peterson Medical Institute currently under construction in Reno, Nevada. Because we don't have all day, I have simplified this story considerably. There are thousands of hours of work done by many wonderful people, but I do not have the time to mention them all in this shortened version of the Institute's development. Perhaps Hillary will help us write that bestseller someday. For those who are not, of you who are not familiar with Nevada, we are the state that sits just east of California. Our city slogan, the biggest little city in the world, seems to fit this institute well as we are small in size compared to other university institutes. We believe, however, that we can make up for our small size by developing a global research program that benefits most by collaborations with the best research scientists in the world. Reviewers of our grants called our project ambitious, which means we don't think you can do it. Surprisingly, we are well on our way, but that is a story that Dr. Mikovits will have to tell you later in the conference. I would like to tell you the story of how it all came about and where we are today. Little did we know when we started down this road to find the missing answers to a devastating disease that so much could happen in such a short period of time. The Whittemore Peterson Institute set out to raise our state's awareness about this disease so that all would understand its serious nature and the need to take immediate action. 
To my surprise, the world took notice. We joined hands with our state legislators, our university, our federal congressional leaders, and private donors to build a unique entity where science can bring energy and truth to a field of medicine that impacts the health of millions around the world. Our first lab is compact, but we have a passionate group of scientists who have seen the patients, listened to their stories, and have dedicated their lives to discovery. It's a very, very powerful tool to have a research scientist sit in the same room, sit across the table from a patient who's so ill, and listen to their story. In fact, we have to tell our young students to go home and take a break, yet they still continue to show up on weekends to do the work that so desperately needs doing. It's no wonder that they are so loyal and enthusiastic. They can't be any other way with a mentor who not only works, outworks all of them, but who demonstrates her personal passion for science and singleness of pur purpose with a kind and often humorous manner. Dr. Judy, as she tells the patients to call her, has taken this field by storm. She saw a need when Dr. Peterson showed his patient slides in Barcelona and asked for help from the audience. Her expert broad training in Frank Rossetti's cancer lab at the National Cancer Institute and her experience in drug development in Southern California had taught her to recognize when something was seriously wrong. Dr. Judy Mikovits answered a plea for help by coming to Reno and has been working for the WPI ever since. You might be wondering what is so different about the work this institute is doing from other studies in other labs. I believe the most important difference is the broad approach to our research. Our researchers have made it their task to answer the most significant group of questions that can exist in this field in a cohort of the sickest patients. Simply put, they are poised to discover the causes of this disease, who is genetically susceptible, and what treatments best fit those patients' individual circumstances. Using all the latest scientific technologies and labs across the United States, including the National Cancer Institute, the Cleveland Clinic, and experienced scientists from the fields of virology, immunology, cancer, and AIDS. We intend to discover what has yet to be confirmed, the underlying causes of disease, sensitive and specific biomarkers, and effective treatments. For I am one who believes very strongly that not every virus associated with ME is the cause of the disease, but rather the evidence of something that has been acquired, resulting in a very dysfunctional immune system. My daughter was a healthy, active child. Then she became ill and never recovered completely, as is the case for most, if not all, ME sufferers. She became more fragile with time and is now suffering from seizures. The disease manifests itself in many different ways, but one thing is evident, it is not going away on its own. Sticking our heads in the sand and pretending it doesn't exist is not helping those who are ill. Calling it ridiculous names doesn't make the suffering go away. And rationing funding of serious research isn't going to stop our work. We may have to work longer and harder to find the truth, but in the end, we will have our answers. And those answers will not be simple or benign but neither is the disease. I am, yes, a parent of a sick child like many of you, only she is not a child any longer. She is 31 and has been ill since the age of 12. In the beginning, I thought she might be dying from some type of cancer, but now I know that she acquired a disease that at the time was relatively unheard of and was given various names, such as post-viral fatigue, chronic Epstein-Barr, yuppie flu, chronic fatigue syndrome, and myalgic encephalomyelitis. We went through the typical round of specialists, paid tens of thousands of dollars, and were cleverly sent off to psychiatrists, who fortunately for us immediately recognized how sick she was and sent her back to her doctors. There were no answers then, and for the last 24 years, too little has changed. We are still seeking accurate diagnostics and effective treatments, yet we consider ourselves to be the lucky ones. We found compassionate care for her pain and sleep and a listening ear when things became too difficult to handle. America's medical system is far from perfect, but we are still allowed to access medical care if we are willing and able to pay for it. She found her way to Amplogen and had eight fairly good years in Dr. Peterson's expert caring hands. I can't imagine what it must be like not to have that alternative. Have you ever wondered what makes doctors 
like Dr. Peterson, stay in a field where the patients are incredibly sick, most can't pay for their care, in a community where they refuse to accept the illness, and where other doctors think CFS is something like Santa Claus, you can choose to believe it or not? Is it because he knows the truth and he's seen it over and over again firsthand? Is it because he believes in the Hippocratic Oath that he took in medical school, first, do no harm? Or is it because he's a dedicated physician who knows that if he does not care, take care of these patients, no one else will? I believe it is all of the above, and today I want to personally thank all of the doctors in this field who have sacrificed a more lucrative lifestyle, practicing any other type of medicine in order to take care of the sickest of the sick. Would you please join with me now as we thank them all by applauding their efforts on behalf of the entire ME community. So many of you wonder, you know, how in the world did a mom of five, homemaker, teacher, educator, decide to build an institute for this terrible disease. Well, my story is a little more practical. I was frightened of the future that I saw for my daughter and our family. I was saddened at the tremendous suffering I saw in the patient's eyes, and I was angry that so little was being done to help. Then I began to get involved slowly at first. It started with a small conference in Reno. Then I helped to create the HHB6 Foundation, and it soon became apparent to me that something more had to be done. I knew that if someone didn't do something fast, my daughter Andrea and so many others like her wouldn't have doctors to take care of them. That realization was the final straw. I could handle most of the day-to-day -day care of a sick child, adult, but I could not imagine not having a physician who would give her fluids to ease her pain and suffering, or antibiotics on a moment's notice when her infections overwhelmed her immune system, or an antiviral when EBV or Coxsackie took over. Visits to our local emergency rooms are constant reminders of the ignorance that still exists everywhere but her doctor's offices. I thought about all the other patients like her who couldn't afford the very treatment that might end their suffering, such as Amplogen. What if another member of my family became ill and there was no one to help them? For all of these reasons and more, I knew that something had to be done quickly, and luckily Dr. Peterson was of the same mindset. He knew that he would retire soon, and so would his contemporaries. There were no new doctors coming into the field. The work was difficult, the hours long, and the same obstacles that existed 25 years ago still exist today, with no FDA-approved diagnostics, no FDA-approved treatments, and very little money dedicated to biological research. As we continued to discuss what was really needed in this field, my husband and I began to think of ways to make it happen. We needed nothing less than a medical center where people could be treated and new doctors could be trained. I'm sure that Dr. Peterson never really thought it would happen in Reno, Nevada. That is, until he heard the announcement one night at his birthday dinner that we were going to create a center for patients one way or another. And that is where the Institute really began, and I think he still has that birthday card. With that balloon on it. <laughs> Enlisting the aid of my husband, who had been an advocate, attorney, and businessman in the Reno community for over 35 years, was one of the best decisions that I ever made. His experience and leadership in the legislature was well known throughout the state. Because of our close friendships with those he worked with over many years, they also knew firsthand how very ill our, doctor, our daughter was with CFS. They were the ones who could get things done in our state our then governor, Kenny Gwen, our legislative friends, and all of our lobbyists. In addition, he and I had been very active supporters of the university. We knew that the university needed new research space. The Nevada Cancer Institute needed medical space in Reno, and we needed space for our institute. It was a perfect fit. The governor agreed to put aside money in his budget to get the project started. And while I put together a compelling argument, Harvey and his friends lobbied to get the indirect research costs returned to our university to support the rest of the building costs. In addition, our family agreed to make a large donation of money to aid the entire project. That was in 2005. Soon after legislative approvals were won, we began the real work of creating an institute. There was no map to follow and no trail already blazed. The plan had to be developed on a daily basis, and believe me, that's exactly what we've been doing. It was soon evident 
that we would need much more than a medical center to meet the needs of this population. This field required well-educated doctors, requiring a comprehensive medical education and training in basic research. Doctors needed information and tools to work with. So we dedicated the first years to this, to this institute to research. We couldn't wait until the government decided to help pay for all that work. The granting process can take years to pay off. So we began to organize a yearly fundraiser to supplement the research costs. We hired Dr. Bikovitz and Dr. Lombardi to open the lab and create the Institute's first research program. Little did we know that Judy was capable of pulling together a world-class team in less than a year. She organized the studies, organized the samples, added a few students, created collaborations, and wrote the grants. But she was told not to wait. That suited her personality to a T, as you'll find Judy is a racehorse in a world of plow horses. In fact, the rest of us just pretend to keep up with her. And since you will be hearing from her later in the day, I will not attempt to describe our research projects at this time. I'll leave the best for last. But I will tell you that the Institute's researchers intend to answer questions such as, what infectious pathogen changes a once healthy immune system into one which can no longer keep normal pathogens in check? Why can't one return to normal and fight off infections as before? Why can't the body refuel its stores of energy? And why do some patients suffer from spinal pain? Why is one weak and nauseated almost every day? And why have patients become allergic to so many medications and foods? Why do they have seizures? If we can answer those questions in a cohort of patients like my daughter, we will be able to answer the questions for many others with similar diseases using the same techniques. I promise that this institute will not stop until we find the answers to these questions. To tr bring effective treatments, to bring patients back to their jobs and families. And finally, discover a preventative strategy that protects others from falling ill. The institute has been given a wonderful opportunity to do great work. Senator Reid, Congressman Shelley Berkeley, and all other congressional members have supported our efforts to bring research tools to Nevada that have strengthened our ability to do cutting edge research in our labs and the laboratories throughout this university. When we required funding to help furnish the institute's exam rooms and laboratories, Senator Reid found a way to help. He has been one of the most vocal supporters of MECFS patients in the United States. And today, I would like you to join in with me as we thank the senator from afar. I know that he would ha be happy to hear that his efforts to bring answers to this field are truly appreciated. And I just I wanted to let all of you know that. I think sometimes those individuals who are working behind the scenes are never quite thanked enough for the work that they do. I've once again gone to our majority leader and asked for his assistance in providing funding for a national research center, a joint collaboration between the University of Nevada and the Whittemore Peterson Institute with several regional medical research centers. He told me that it will take much more effort on everyone's part to make that happen. He cannot do this alone. We need the help of many more of our congressional representatives to persuade our national health agencies that this field is in dire need of answers that come with dedicated research funding. We believe that with our new president's commitment to research in the U.S., there comes a perfect opportunity to make up for so many years of insufficient funding. I believe letters from around the world would make a significant impact, and I invite you to write your letters to our congressmen and women telling them of your support of these efforts. If you would like to do so, you can visit our website at www.wpinstitute.org for a listing of those names and addresses and a letter which will describe this project called Stand Up for ME. And finally, the best news is that the Whittemore Peterson Institute will open its new home in September of 2010. At that time, we will do all we can to provide an expert medical practice for the evaluation and treatment of patients and to continue our critical missions in research and education. I know that the work we do in Nevada, in conjunction with others around the world, will have a positive impact on all of our lives. We don't need to build many institutes, but we do need to build partnerships and collaborations. Thank you again for your support of this important conference and of those who seek answers to ME and CFS. I hope that you'll find this year's conference enjoyable, informational, and inspiring.
Thank you.